class, we started talking about clustering. And clustering is a um, very powerful, uh, you know, I will say unsupervised uh, data analysis technique. You can, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would call it a machine learning method, but I would call it a, a um, you know, a prerequisite to doing a lot of data exploration and a lot of, uh, you know, and, um, you know, meaningful classification in many cases. Um, and I wanted, last as we started talking about uh, k-means clustering, which is a very important cl uh, clustering method. But I wanted to talk about, just to give you an example of a famous clustering problem and how being able to do the clustering um, made a big difference in understanding how, you know, biological systems work and things like that. So what is this thing? This thing that you see on the screen is a uh, the result of a clustering done on data um, in measuring uh, how genes uh, behave in the cell cycle. So what do you guys know about biology? You probably don't know, you know, there's no reason you, you need to know too much, but you probably have the vision that uh, that that cells, you guys are made up of cells. And you have probably seen pictures in your textbook of how cells divide. Kind of, if you think about it, they start out like that. When they get too big, they decide to divide. They uh, start to separate and they eventually pinch off. And event, that's how you get two cells out of one cell. So the question that the biologists wanted to study was what genes were involved in um, making cells divide. Okay, cell division is in a very important part of biology. Cancer is a disease of cell division. If you could understand which genes were involved in cell division and what they did, that would actually be, a, a, you know, be, be very important. So how did they find this out? They, they uh, developed a technology that for every one of a, that, that would measure a biological sample and for every gene in the organism would be able to measure how turned on it was versus or, or how turned off it was at a particular time. Genes, because of gene regulation, you know, uh, there's, there's sometimes conditions where genes are going to be making proteins, making RNAs to make proteins. Sometimes they're not. When they're not making it, we say they're turned off. When we say they're making a lot of them, we say that it's turned on. And we can measure the expression level of every protein as a function of time. So what did these guys do? They took as input uh, a, a collection of cells. They synchronized the cells. So they got them at starting at the exact same point in the cell cycle. And then they, um, every 10 minutes, they, they, would, they would let the cells go. And then every 10 minutes, they would pull out a chunk of cells and measure for every cell, for every gene, how turned on and, or turned off were the cells at that time. Where, where was that gene in those cells turned on or turned off? So the way to read this plot is, that as we go from uh, top to bottom, this is reflecting time, okay? There is a row for every 10, um, 10, every 10 minute period. And every column is representing a gene, okay? And uh, this is, I believe, yeast. This is presumably several hundred interesting genes that they're showing here. and a, a, a thing, a, a cell is red if the gene is turned off at that time. The cell is green if it is turned on at that time. And it is black if it's kind of in the middle. Okay, that's the kind of the way I'm going to read this thing. Now, what do you see here when you look at this? Okay, I know we don't have, we, I don't think we have any biologists in here. But when you look at this picture, what do you see? Does anybody see anything? Uh, 
Very few of the genes are neutral. What? Very few genes are just staying where they are and doing nothing. They're always turned on or turned off. Why is that? Probably that's because they were probably deleted from the picture because they were boring. But you're right that they're that that in this example, I don't it does seem like every one of the genes that they're showing, in fact, vary with with time. Okay. And that's not true for all genes, but I think it's true for the ones we have here. So that's certainly one thing that we see. There's, what else do we see? There's also very few genes that transition from being in one state to the other state. You're saying that there's few genes that transition from one state to a state to another state. I don't know what. But what do you? I don't know what you from, mean. From that. on to off, or on off to on. So they've they've highlighted E, D, C, B, and A. Yeah. Even A, I'd argue, isn't really like a transition, but that's B, C, D, and E uh, is really the only one where you see any transition. Okay, what of you're states. saying is that in these glumps, okay, the E genes, okay, there was suddenly a moment where they were kind of neutral and bam, they all turned off, right? And yes. if you looked at the A genes, okay, you said that they were off. But then there was a time when, bam, they went on, okay? And uh, the if you look at these things, okay, um, it should be clear that the gene, that the behavior of the genes is occurring in clumps, okay? All the E genes look a lot like each other. All the D genes look a lot like each other. All the B genes and the C genes. And now why is that? That means that they are turning on or turning off at the same point in the cell cycle, okay? That means there must be the same thing turning them on and off, okay? Why did all of you guys suddenly turn on Zoom at 9.45 today? It's because the same thing is regulating you. You are a member of the class. There's an explanation for that. Now, how did we decide what were the A, B, C, D, and E genes here? The answer is that came out of clustering them. If you look at what happened, you, it's easy to kind of see that there are these groups of genes, okay? But where did you see the groups of genes? This is only because the genes were kind of clustered into groups and the order of the, of the genes on the x-axis is described by what group they're in. It should be clear that if you just sorted the genes alphabetically by name, you would be seeing a, 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 a mess of red and green dots and you wouldn't see understand anything, okay? Basically, what, the, what, what this experiment did is after it found what the... Um, what, you know, what measured what the expression of each gene was over time. It did a clustering. And the clusters kind of were fell, you know, kind of, you know, you look at that, you do see distinct clusters. These distinct clusters require explanations. And now the question is not which genes are turned on at the same time. But now that if we know that all of these are in the same group, why are they turned on? How are they turned on at the same time? And so based on this, you could now figure out what is turning genes on. And, you know, you now can explore questions like what are the regulatory factors that are turning genes on and off? Okay. Any questions? I didn't show you the picture of what it would look like if the uh, genes were permuted randomly. Okay. But, but it would, I think you guys should, should believe that if I just scramble the rows, you will see a mess. Any questions about that? So the, the cluster analysis showed us several groups, genes behave in a small number of distinct groups. There must be explanations for that. Any questions? And that's what we like from a cluster analysis. Any questions? What is this thing on top? The thing on top is going to be important in a, in a minute or in a, in a couple minutes. What is that thing on top? The way this clustering was done was by uh, doing a, what we're going to call an agglomerative clustering. 
How did that clustering algorithm work? Well, basically it found pairs of genes that were, it, it had a distance function. If you think about what is, what were we clustering? We're clustering the columns. Each column is a point in it looks like something like 12 dimensional space. I think they sampled this thing at 12 different time points. This meant that we had points in 12 dimensions. In order to cluster it, we needed a, um, a distance function or a similarity function to measure, uh, you know, let's say a, a distance function to measure how far is the expression profile from this gene, from this gene. The similarity, the distance would be less between this gene and this gene than it would between this gene and that gene, okay? What did this particular clustering algorithm do? Basically, it went through all the pairs of genes and found which two were most similar and it merged them into a cluster. And then it repeated which two, initially every gene was in its own cluster. And then we merged two genes that were in the nearest, that, that were the closest together. We merged the two clusters that were closest together, kept doing this merging. Whenever we did one of these mergings, okay, there was going to be, when we decide to merge them, there is a measure of similarity between the two clusters. If we are always merging the closest pair, we would expect that the initial mergings, the, the, the distance will be small. The last mergings we do will be merging highly different clusters and that will be expensive. What is this tree showing us? The height, if you look, uh, if you look at the, uh, this, these nodes, these heights are going to be, um, what you call it, the height of, of uh, each branch here represents how, uh, how close were the two things we merged. So what does this tree tell us? The tree tells us it wasn't very expensive to do any of that merging, right? Because each one of the pairs that we're merging were pretty close. These node things over here tell us that it wasn't very expensive doing those mergings because they were all very similar. What got expensive? It gets expensive when you're merging clusters that are quite different than each other, okay? And as you look over here, the merging, the height of this thing is reflecting merging different clusters together. And ultimately the final merge was the split between the stuff on this side, which was almost all turned off, and the stuff on this side that was all turned on. Okay, any questions about that? Do people see how to read one of these things? Okay, you see how to read one of these dendrograms? Okay, and why, why they might be interesting? Okay, any questions? And does everybody see that once I have this dendrogram, that's what described the layout of the genes. Notice that at the beginning, I just gave you a matrix to cluster. There was no order on them, was there? But I did know that my highest um, merge was this one over here. And so what did I do? I said, I'm gonna do my layout where I put all the ones that were on the on one side of my tree from the merge to the left of all the elements on the right side, okay? And the tree is going to kind of define what the order here is for my visualization. Does everybody kind of see that what's nice about this tree, in this tree, I have no crossings, okay? I am kind of building this tree up like that. Once I have a tree with no crossings, that is what's going to describe the, uh, the ordering of these genes. Any questions?
Okay. What I hope to convince you of is that the uh, what you call it, that that um, that that doing a cluster analysis of a high dimensional data set can reveal things you wouldn't otherwise have seen seen. Okay. And that doing a, 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 an agglomerative clustering where you're merging them provides some kind of an interesting uh, potential visualization of that. Any questions? One thing about the binary, the, the tree visualization, if you uh, look at it that way, is to also note that it's not a completely deterministic thing. Suppose I give you a binary tree that looks like that, four of them, okay? How many, and if, if this was just kind of uh, the result of an unordered merge, what other arrangements are consistent with this tree? Does everybody see that we could swap one and two? And that would be equally equally valid with this tree. We could swap three and four, and that would be equally valid with the tree. We could swap the left side and the right side. So this became two, one, and this became four, three. So all told, there are a lot of different orderings of the, uh, what you call it, of the, the rows that are consistent with that tree. Okay, but um, you know, picking one in a sensible way, all of them should preserve the basic similarity here, and one of them will will presumably do the best. Any questions about this agglomerative clustering idea, or why clustering is an important thing? Okay, good. So last class I talked about k-means clustering. K means was a world where we picked K, we said, decided in advance they were going to be K clusters. Okay. And, um, and basically uh, picked the representatives at random at first, then moved everybody to the nearest, uh, you know, representative, recomputed the representative based on the elements in it, and kept iterating until things converged. That was k-means clustering, and um, again, I we 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 discussed uh, I, 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 as we discussed. Generally speaking, this produces good clusters. Okay, but there are examples where k-means doesn't necessarily do exactly exactly the right thing. One is what if we have two clusters? Decide that there's two clusters. And we were given uniformly selected points. Okay, there really isn't a good clustering here. But K means will happily put the two points someplace to divide it. Okay. Um, and, you know, and if you give it three clusters, it will happily put the three points someplace. Okay. And keep doing it for as many values of K as you want. Okay. So that's. This is one where it's bad for any clustering algorithm, but I guess it's bad that k-means doesn't recognize it. Some of the other methods may actually show you a little bit better. You'll be able to see better when you got a bad cluster. How many clusters do you see in this point set? <clears throat> We've got what look like yellow point, a, a, a cluster here that is very tight. And we have a cluster here that is very, um, what you call it, it has a high variance, okay? K-means has a hard time trying to find where is the end of the cluster, okay, for the one with the, the high variance thing. Does everybody kind of see that? You would like it to sort of find that there is a big cluster, a, a tight cluster and a diffuse cluster. Okay, if we pick the cluster center for both of them, we end up taking, you know, which is probably what k-means is ultimately going to converge on. 
it's going to decide that all of these points belong to the yellow cluster because they're on that side of the line. Any questions? And the figure on the right, I kind of liked, okay, is what happened when you, what happens when you set up a, an example where you've got a lot of classes. Here we had 50 points taken at random. We generate points in a Gaussian distribution around the center. And we tell k-means, cluster this thing, find the best clustering, okay? If you look at it, in many places, it does a pretty, quite a good job. I think this cluster is right. This is right, 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 right. On the other hand, it sometimes gets fooled. Here, this cell has parts of three different clusters to it, okay? Um, Sometimes clusters get split. Here is a cluster that got split, okay? Um, here's a cluster that got split. In general, okay, um, you know, obviously the more distinct the clusters are, the easier they are to find. The smaller number, the, the easier it is to find, okay? Um, and, you know, but, you know, you know, I think in general, K-means does a pretty good job. Any questions about that? Any questions about k-means, how it works, or why it's a good thing? Last thing I wanted to say about k-means, which I didn't get to mention, is that um, it's kind of k-means is kind of the classic representation of what they call an expectation maximization algorithm. You sometimes hear about EM algorithms, expectation maximization algorithms. And the name here, to me, makes no sense. Okay, so I never, I have a tough time interpreting these things. But if you think about what K means is doing, it goes through iterations of the following point. It is assigning points, all the points, to what is the uh, current best label, which is the estimating clusters. And then you are using these assignments to, to improve the parameter estimates. Given that we started out with a random or arbitrary set of cluster centers, we assigned each point to which cluster it was. Okay, then we, after we did this assignment, we refined the, our estimates of the parameters of our you know, model, in this case, the clustering by taking the centroid, okay, of the points in each current cluster. In EM algorithms, ex uh, 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 work by doing this kind of um, rounds of, basically um, do an assignment of, you know, uh, of, of elements to groups, and then refining the groups, uh, refining the parameters of your model based on this, uh, the, these groups. And you keep doing this again and again until it, uh, what you call it, it um, converges. And um, one example of a kind of an EM approach to classification that sometimes proves very useful. Suppose you have a world where, let's say like you're working in a natural language processing thing, where you've got a million, you know, millions or billions of tweets, and you've got a small number of tweets that you have paid somebody to classify. Let's say you want to try to build a model to separate hate speech from non-hate speech. Maybe you paid someone and they read a thousand tweets and they said, non-hate, non-hate, hate, 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 non-hate, non-hate. They classify a small number of them. How can we use the whole body of the unsupervised tweets? We have a billion, uh, you know, a a you know, a million or a billion tweets we could learn from. What if we take our human annotated data, okay, and build a classifier on that? If so, we can now classify all the tweets, okay, all billion of them, 
into are they members of the hate class or the non-hate class now we've got you know millions or millions of tweets in each of the two classes instead of having hundreds now we can do a better job training a model that fits these things okay and based on this we're now going to train on our you know a, a, a model on the million tweet um, again, based on that model, we can now go and reassign it, okay? And, uh, and the hope would be that after a small number of iterations, we're converging. The classifications that we made at one level are the classifications we're going to make at the other level. This is a good example of an approach to semi-supervised learning, okay? Where you pay for only a small amount of annotation. Okay, but try to leverage that on a much bigger data set. Any questions about expectation maximization or semi-supervised learning or k-means or anything like that? Good. Okay, what I'd like to now do is to talk more about the methods for agglomerative clustering, okay? Agglomerative clustering was what we saw on that gene expression data set. And what it basically is, is a bottom-up merging procedure, okay? Suppose we go and find which two points are closest to each other and merge them, merge them, merge them, okay? What is going to end up happening? We're going to merge them. Then we're going to end up creating a merging here and creating merging here. In the end, we have one, you know, uh, tree linking all the uh, points together. Um, with agglomerative clustering, in some sense, it gives you not just one clus clustering, but a large number of different clusterings depending upon what the level of specificity you wanted to see. If we go back to our example of our, uh, what you call it? Back to our example of our phylogenic tree. How many clusters do we have here? Does everybody see that after merging them, we end up with everything is in the same tree? How would you decide how many clusters there are in this data set? Or where would you do it to make clusters? What do you do to the full tree? Everybody see a tree always contains one connected component. There's only one cluster defined by the, you know, the whole thing is in one set defined by the merging of the root. How would we create, uh, generate clusters from this? How would we identify clusters from this? I claim if you delete the last, the, 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 the merging steps that involve the biggest height trees, Okay, if you decide to delete all merges above a certain cost, you will end up with separate components. And that's kind of the way that agglomerative clustering works. It, it merges the whole set just like this, okay? If you want to construct the actual clusters individually, you delete the most expensive merges. And in this case, it's obvious that the last two merges were far more expensive than the others. And that's why you would call this three, um, what you call it, three components. Any questions about that? This algorithm of merging, um, what you call it, the two near, repeatedly merging the two nearest points. You guys saw that when you took an algorithms class. Merging, repeatedly merging the two biggest points is a Kruskal's algorithm. 
the two nearest points, that was Kruskal's algorithm. And uh, if, 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 if it built a minimum spanning tray, in fact, this algorithm of constantly merging the two nearest points, so long as they are in different components, that actually is an agglomerative clustering algorithm called single link clustering. Any questions? So agglomerative clustering has a close relationship with um, what you call it, with a uh, minimum spanning trip. Any questions? Okay. So one way to interpret a agglomerative clustering is to think in terms of the minimum spanning tree. The other is to think in terms of a, this, what we call this dendogram, where what we're going to do is um, when we have a merge, we, we link those two with a node of height equal to the length of the edge. Okay. So, um, and when we did our third merge, we mer mer our second merge, it was merging V4 with the component that we had here. That is going to be this node merge up, up there. Okay. So what is the claim here? The claim here is that um, agglomerative clustering is related to minimum spanning tree construction, at least when we talk about single link clustering. And it is well described by one of these dendograms, okay, which shows us what we actually, the merging pattern is. Any questions? Um, but yeah, what does it mean by height? So, okay, if you look at this thing, Let's look at the minimum spanning tray here. How many nodes were in this tray? Let's look at this. What would be the interpret? Uh, sorry, what would be the interpretation that I want to see here? Here I have a node, a a, a uh, tree. I've got five nodes. One, one, two, three, four, five. There are going to be in the course of merging this thing. When you merge things, you're adding an edge. In this case, I am adding these four edges. There's going to be n minus one edges added. Each edge is going to be merging two of them. What should be the cost of the merge? That's kind of what, what this is about. The, if we did Kruskal's algorithm, again, picture that this is a complete graph weighted by distance. It is clear that the closest pair of points here is V1 and V2. The distance between V1 and V2 is that distance one. We would like to arrange our dendogram where that's V1, that's V2, and this is this height D1. Okay. We're then gonna, to continue with Kruskal's algorithm, merge the pair of points that are from different clusters that are closest. And in fact, we happen to have found that merging um, v, V2 and V3 was the closest remaining thing. Now, in a dendogram, we're not merging points, but we're merging clusters. This was an isolated cluster. This was a cluster. So our next step is going to be that we're going to merge them. And the height of this edge should be D1, D2, the cost of that merge. The next merge that happened, we probably would have investigated that edge, but that edge was already in the, uh, what you call it, in the, um, you know, uh, you know, it was within a component already. The next edge that spanned components was this thing. We would again expect to add V4 to our component and the height of this thing should be uh, the edge D3. And the final merging, this should have height D4. You see that the height is, uh, th 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 that, that, that the, uh, the connection is representing the merging of two clusters. The height is going to be the, uh, what you call it, the, the, the cost of the, uh, the merge. Any questions? Now, 
distance function, we talked about distance functions, distance functions between points. I think we really understand, you know, you understand. We talked about the different LP norms and, and we, you know, stuff like that. What it means to merge two clusters though, if you think about it, now when we, we want to now measure the distance, not between points in general, but between clusters. So what is the distance between this cluster and this cluster? And I'm gonna claim that there's at least four um, reasonable ways that you can define what that distance is. When we were doing the minimum spanning tree algorithm, or you know what we were doing basically was saying that the distance between two clusters is defined by the closest point between those two clusters. So if you have two close to clusters like this and another cluster like that, the, the cost of the, the, the distance between the clusters is that, okay? The closest merger there, okay? This is quick. It gives us things like minimum spanning trees. But that may not be what you would really want expressed as the distance between those two clusters. Another measure might be to take the average distance between a point in one cluster and a point in the other cluster. Does everybody see that if I take for every point in this cluster, I compute its distance, average distance to the, uh, what you call it, to the, um, to, to, to all the points in the other cluster, okay? And I average this out. In this case, if my points existed like this, okay, my average distance would probably be something closer to this than it would be to that, okay? So this gives us seemingly a more robust estimate of how far two clusters are. But what's the problem there? Well, okay. it just takes forever to calculate. It doesn't take forever, forever. Very long, long time, time. But it does take time uh, quadratic in the number of points in the clusters to compute that. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's another distance measure metric that's kind of interesting? What if we take the centroid of the points in each cluster and compute the distance between the centroid? What's nice is the centroid of a cluster is basically just what you get by averaging the two dimensions. Okay, averaging the points along each dimension. This should take time linear in the size of, the, of each cluster meaning the number of points times the dimensions. And once you add the centroid, okay, the um, cost of actually computing the distance between that should be just proportional to the number of dimensions. So measuring the distance between the centroids is a, um, you know, has the property of being a cheap metric, but also uh, more robust than, than the nearest neighbor merging. Any questions? And another measure that turns out to be kind of interesting is uh, one that takes, instead of finding, saying the distance between, um, between two, uh, two clusters is reflected by the most unhappy pair of points in the cluster, the maximum distance between a point between one and the other. Okay, this one has the property that through some computational geometry magic, you can compute this faster than you can compute that. Okay, at least in low dimensions. But, um, you know, uh, anyway, so those are four different possibilities. Okay, here are kind of the more formal definitions of these things. But the idea behind the agglomerate of clustering is, you pick one of these four metrics as your, um, what you call it, your uh, distance between cluster measure. 
and then repeatedly merge clusters according to this. Any questions? Actually, one thing that's not ever, that that is a little piece of trivia that you may some of you may like. Turns out that actually a lot of the agglomerative clustering methods were invented at Stony Brook or developed at Stony Brook, but not in the computer science department, in the ecology and evolution department, where they were interested in building phylogenetic trees of things and stuff like that. They did a lot of work on agglomerate, early work on agglomerate cl clustering there. Question. Any questions? For... Um, for the agglomerate of clustering, we have something like nearest neighbor, right? How do you do nearest neighbor for like clusters of points? So how do you do nearest neighbors for clusters of points? Well, that's kind of what these criteria are being. This is, um, okay, so what, what are you saying now? In steady state, we've got a bunch of clusters, okay? And we know how many clusters we had. Originally, we started with N and we were going to go down to one. What we want to now know, what these linkage criteria tell us, is how do we figure out what the cost difference is between clusters, okay, as, you know, a function of our underlying point distance measure. So in some sense, to figure out which the next cluster that's going to be merged, you have to basically look at every pair of clusters, okay? So the way to figure out what the next merge is, is going to be a uh, thing that is gonna take, you know, you're gonna do C squared comparisons if you have C clusters. And for each cluster, you're gonna pay, you know, the, the time it takes is in this case, going to be for nearest neighbor. Um, this is going to be quite, uh, quadratic in the number of points, average link, okay? Um, actually, depending upon how you represent the, the, the information for nearest Nate, for single link clustering, you can do it faster, okay? But I guess the, 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 the point is you're gonna be explicitly comparing every cluster against every other cluster and computing the distance between clusters according to the appropriate formula you choose. And the nearest one is the, you know, the one that you're gonna merge. Does that answer your question or maybe not? Um, well, I'm wondering like, when you're comparing these clusters, are you comparing their centroids or are you comparing every point of them? So the answer is it depends which you pick. If you want, you know, one fair way of doing it, that you might like is to compare the centroid. If you compare, comparing the centroid is one metric, and the advantage of that is that it's gonna take C squared time regardless of how many points are in the, uh, what you call it. I guess to compute the underlying centroids would take order N, because every point is, you know, uh, is, uh, assuming the number, well, n times d, let's just be a little bit more size. To compute the centroids, we are, is gonna take time linear in the data. And then once we have uh, the centroids for each cluster, we're gonna spend c squared time comparing the centroids to identify the nearest one. Okay, so if you choose this linkage criteria, which is, I think, a, 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 a generally good way to do it, okay? You would be comparing centroids. If you were using single link clustering, you would just be doing um, minimum spanning tree computations, which are, you know, quite fast and there are good codes for. If you wanna use, or you might choose to use some of these alternate criteria, okay? Generally speaking, I like the centroid method and I like the single link method, okay? If you have large enough N, single link method is probably the right thing to do, okay? Um, but the centroid clustering uh, is, is, I think, generally more robust. Any questions? So what is the running time? Well, you're gonna basically do um, a total of N minus one merging steps. 
And you also pay the cost of the uh, finding what is the nearest neighbor here. And depending upon what the linkage criteria, that governs the cost of what it is for each iteration. One way to speed this thing up is, a, is the observation that suppose, let's say I had computed the distance between all pairs of clusters so far. If I knew the distance between all C squared clusters and I saved that someplace, after I decide to merge these two, uh, let's say I decide to merge these two clusters. Now, the only distances that get updated, merging these two clusters does not affect the distance between X and Y. It affects the distance between all others and the merged clusters. So now they are basically gonna be, after I've done this merge, before I knew the distance between every pair of clusters, now I've got to update it. And for all the remaining clusters, I need to compute what the distance is between it and the new merged cluster. So if I do this, I can only have to update a linear number of these things instead of all n squared pairs each iteration. Any questions? Okay. So what are good things about uh, agglomerative clustering? Again, k-means is very, very popular because it's fast and uh, it's easy to do. One thing is it does provide a visualization, which is nice. One thing is we get an actual distance uh, measure between clusters, which is helpful. But maybe the most compelling thing for, uh, for you know, a reason why we might be interested in agglomerative clustering is it permits easy classification of new things. If we have a rooted tree, Okay, and um, you know, basically at each node, if we wanna figure out what cluster something is in, we can compare it at the highest level. Does it look like it more likely belongs in this big cluster or that big cluster? If so, we then move down the tree. And so in some sense, in, to try to identify what cluster we get in, it is now going to be something like, uh, okay, it's gonna be proportional to the height of the merging tree, okay? Instead of the number of elements in it, okay? And this kind of, this kind of uh, classification method makes it much faster to classify what, what cluster somebody belongs in. Any questions? Okay, so what clustering algorithm should you use? Again, I've talked about two and I'm gonna talk about another one. But what I will say is in general, the um, just like I think the impact of different machine learning methods is less than people think, okay? Um, the difference of the clustering algorithm in particular is usually less than what you think, okay? The key things where it's important is to make sure you use the right, a, a, a distance function that does measure similarity between your elements correctly, okay? And that you properly normalize your, your elements, your variables, so that no, no one dimension is dominating everything, okay? But generally speaking, in most cases, different clustering algorithms will produce roughly the same kind of clustering for a given uh, distance function. Any questions? Now, the exception comes in when you are really looking for skinny clusters. Let's take a look at this point set over here, okay? Which uh, again, if we look at it, if we look at it classified here, I think the eye will naturally um, make this thing see that you've got three different clusters. Again, to a certain extent, the number of clusters you have is in the eye of the beholder, okay? But if I look at this thing, I am quite comfortable saying I've got two long skinny clusters and one, um, what you call it, one uh, round circular cluster. If I did it by k-means, 
There is no place I can put the K points, okay? So as to separ accurately separate these things. If I put my, I mean, what would be the best possible place on this example to put um, three points? In this case, it looked like the um, K mean settled on something like this, this, and this, okay? In general, for K means wants round clusters because the power of a point is going to be its neighborhood around it. Okay. K means won't produce skinny clusters. Okay. Um, agglomerative clustering. Okay. And in particular, single linkage cl agglomerative clustering might produce skinny clusters. What would happen here if we started trying to cluster it? Remember, we're always merging the nearest points to everything, okay? And so long as the, long, the, the, the nearest point across the clusters is large relative to the points, with the distance within it, the cluster, single linkage clustering would do great. But it, let's say we had one extra point here. Let's say I had one extra point over here, okay? That would be enough that this would be a small distance. This would be a small distance. This would be a small distance. I would be very happy to merge this cluster to this cluster on the basis of one, you know, misplaced point, okay? And so agglomerative clustering can give me skinny clusters but it doesn't necessarily give me um, what you call it, uh, skinny clusters in a robust manner. Okay, any questions? So there are other classes of clustering algorithms that try to, that, that uh, are better at kind of separating off dense regions, okay, from non-dense regions. And these revolve around uh, um, what we would call a similarity graph. Suppose, let's say we have n items in our, uh, what you call it, um, you know, let's say n items in our, that we want to cluster. We're going to make an n by n matrix of how similar these items are. Now, distance, which we have talked about, is uh, a measure where when things are, are more similar, a distance is small, it's zero. When things are far apart, a distance is large, okay? In a similarity matrix, we're gonna try to kind of invert that relationship. And we're gonna say that um, Sij is gonna be a measure of how much how alike they actually are, okay? And a, you know, a what one way to deal, do this, okay, that is that 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 is useful, is to um, you know, try to create a similarity matrix where the values range from zero to one, okay, where zero means no similarity, one means perfect similarity. If we have a um, function like this, where we have expressed similarity as being e, okay, to the minus beta times the distance between x and y. If they are, if the distance is very, very close, if the distance is zero, e to the minus zero is one, okay? So, um, so, so, uh, so, so if they are, are, what you call it, are the same or very, very close to us, the similarity here would go to one. If on the other hand, the distance is very, very large, this is E one over E to the large number. As the distance gets large, the similarity is gonna go to zero. By using this kind of a weighting, we can express similarities between zero and one. And what's good about that is 
that that starts to make our matrix of similarities look like a graph, look like an adjacency matrix of a graph, okay? All small numbers could be set to zero, meaning there is no connection between I and J. All things close to one can be said that there is a connection between them, okay? And so viewing um, things as a similarity graph gives us a different way to think about clusters, to think about clusters in terms of graph theoretic ideas like cuts, okay? So if we have a graph where now um, we have edges between things that are deemed similar, what would be our dream clustering? Our dream would be that we were dealing with individual connected components. Each connected component was dense, okay? And there were no elements between them, you know, no edges spanning different clusters. That would have been the ideal clustering of a similarity graph. On one level, we could think of clustering in a similarity graph as just finding connected components, which is easy. But alternately, if there's, we would like that there are graph theoretic ideas of trying to find what are the smallest number of edges to disconnect the graph? That kind of a thing is like finding a cut, okay? And so our dream clustering is going to be, basically, if we have a good similarity graph, we will have clusters which have a high weight, a lot of edges defined between them, and a small weight cut. Okay, a small number of edges that are necessary to separate those clusters. Any questions? So the good thing is that this gets us into graph algorithm world, okay? And that there are algorithms to find what are the smallest number of edges to disconnect the graph, okay? Um, if you think about it, uh, if you have a view the graph as being a collection of pipes, okay, and you measure how much stuff flows, can you know if you if you view a network as being a network of pipes, and each pipe has a capacity. One thing you get, the the network flow problem asks us how much uh stuff what's the maximum amount of liquid we can flow between any two pair of vertices network flow has a fast algorithm this is a good thing okay the limitation on flow is going to be defined by kind of a bottleneck namely a cut if we have a graph that looks like this To get from S to T. All the flow from S to T would have to pass through this thing. So there is a relationship between the maximum amount of flow between two places and the smallest amount of edges, edge weight that you can cut to separate these two. So the good thing is using network flow, we can find the minimum cut in a graph and find the smallest number weight edges that will disconnect it. Okay, so this is good. What is less good, however? What is the smallest number of edges you need to disconnect this graph? One. One, and that's going from H to, uh, from, from H to, to G. Would you want, again, the lowest degree vertex, okay, is certainly going to be a cut that's probably pretty small, okay? If you look at this thing, the, the smallest cut in this graph is simply to chop, disconnect the lowest degree vertex. So the cut by itself, unless we have a graph that really has a large chunk, a large chunk, and a small weight separating it. Unless we have a situation like that, we have a big danger that the, the minimum cut will cut off isolated vertices instead of 
cutting the graph roughly in half. What would be a cut we'd be more interested in? I think that the most interesting cut of this graph is probably here. On the top part, you have a fairly densely connected thing. On the bottom part, you have a roughly equal sized thing, okay? And there's relatively few connections between them. So when we want to try to find a partition, a graph into uh, the cuts, into a, cl the, uh, uh, clustering, we want to try to find cu a cut set to split the graph. We don't just want a small cut, but we want one that will produce a, that where both pieces have fairly large numbers of vertices. That's something that people call the graph partitioning problem. Find a small cut that will partition the vertices roughly equally, okay? That unfortunately is an NP-complete problem. So if we try to think in terms of that, we have to think in terms of certain kinds of heuristics and things like that. So, but what is a criteria that, that turns out to be both co relatively computable and relatively meaningful for partitioning, um, what you call it, uh, um, for partitioning, uh, you know, clusters. We can say that an interesting cluster, okay, uh, the, the interest of a cluster in particular can be defined by its conductance. What is the conductance of a cluster? It is the weight of the edges that cut it, meaning separate that cluster from the rest of the graph, divided by the weight of the edges defined within the cluster. So if we take a look at this particular cluster over here, there are um, many edges defined within the cluster. There is a smaller number of edges that when you dis that that you need to cut in order to disconnect that cluster from the rest of the graph. The ratio of the weight of the cut edges versus the internal edges, that is the conductance. And what we want is one, uh, our clusters. We're excited about clusters that, um, re that have cheap, dis we're, we're disconnecting relatively little compared to what is inside of it. In order to get a high conductance, we want a lot of weight inside of it. That's going to skew us to having bigger clusters, whereas just considering the cut set weight is going to skew us to having a small cluster. Okay. Any questions about that? So, what is what is the thing to note? If we have a similarity matrix. And it is broken nicely into clusters. Okay. Here I claim over here is a similarity matrix. I claim after we had clustered it, this in fact happens to have come from five clusters. Okay. Each of which have a very, very good conductance. Okay. If assuming the blues are zeros, assuming the colored edges are, are, are larger numbers. Okay, it should be clear that the sum of the colors in here minus the sum of the edges disconnecting these things to the rest of the graph, this is going to be a high conductance cluster or a low conductance cluster, excuse me. Low conductance clusters are defined by blocky similarity matrices. This much I think people can see. Okay, we want a, uh, sorry, hold on. Okay, sorry. We want a, uh, okay, there we go, bingo. Okay, we, that, 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 that if we have a uh, similarity matrix that is blocky, okay, then 
That's what reflects a good set partitioning into low conductance clusters. These similarity matrices, as we've defined, should be symmetric. The similarity of point I to point J should be the same as point J to point I if we were using a, basing it on a real distance metric. What we end up getting are blocky symmetric matrices. And if that's true, that's exactly the kind of thing that we saw when we did our eigenvalue vector decomposition. Remember when uh, something that was symmetric, covariance matrices were symmetric. The eigenvalue decomposition, eigenvector decomposition, was partitioning the thing into matrices such that we had important eigenvectors and the dot product of the vector and its transpose define these things. This is an argument that if there is a lot of similarity, if we have a world where there are high conductance clusters, the eigenvector decomposition should be a good thing to be able to, to understand it. So what is spectral clustering? Spectral clustering is a method where we take our similarity matrix and we do a little, um, uh, uh, what you call it, we, we convert it to a different matrix where um, we add, where, um, which is called the Laplacian, where we add, um, we, 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 we take our adjacency matrix, I'll call it W. The, the D matrix is gonna be a diagonal matrix where we have the, um, basically the value on the diagonal is the sum of all the elements on that row on that row or column, okay? So if we think about it, if it's a symmetric matrix, the sum of the values on this row are gonna be the same as the sum of values on that column. DI is, DII is gonna represent the, the sum of the elements on um, the, the ith row. Okay, it turns out that if you do that thing, and you take the eigenvectors of this matrix, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the, um, what you call it, these, these eigenvectors as features for um, the points, okay? And then do k-means clustering on these features. And it turns out that this, this formulation captures these high conductance clusters. Okay, and um, so the idea here is, and here's, I guess, the example that I want to conclude on. What is the idea? We build a similarity matrix. In this particular example, there were three clusters. Okay, we can see the clusters if we permute the rows and columns right, but if we don't see the clusters, they're, they're still there if we compute the uh, eigenvectors. And if we find the, what we will do is find the most important eigenvectors. Okay, in this case, we happen to have done three of them. Okay. And this is what the vectors look like. Okay. Um, in this particular version of, of spectral clustering, they then kind of discretize each one of these vectors, okay? So that uh, they had, you know, what you call it, simpler forms. But once you look at that, it should be clear that for those points, when you look at the three uh, biggest components, okay? Then in fact, um, at this point, these features are, make it very, very obvious what the, the, the classes are. These points are ones that are high, high, low. These ones are the ones that are low, low, low. These ones are the ones that are high, low, low, okay? And so the claim is that with, with spectral clustering, we basically compute eigen, use, use eigen, the, the main eigenvalue vectors as the features. 
And that's what base, and then to basically do K means clustering on it. Any questions about it? If they weren't perfect, if the affinity matrix wasn't just perfect squares and there was like some mix between them, what would the raw normalization look like? Well, okay, first of all, let's think what would happen before we did that. Let's say that there was noise there. What would happen when we did the eigenvector decomposition? If we did the complete decomposition for all the vectors, we are gonna reconstruct this matrix exactly. But what are the most important vectors going to uh, do? The noise here, okay, is gonna be sort of reflected by the less important eigenvector features. Does that kind of make sense? When we did the dimension reduction, we had to express this matrix by, um, if we're only using three eigenvectors here, we are gonna get a very blocky similarity matrix, okay? Because it will throw out the noise of these other things that are linked. Those are gonna be defined in the smaller, you know, by the less important eigenvectors, okay? So really what this is doing is by, by taking the most important eigenvectors, we are throwing away in some sense the edges that are, you know, kind of contribute less, you know, that, that, that are kind of more isolated, less, you know, and, and, and clean it up and make for clearer clustering. Does that answer your question? I think so. You think so? Okay, I think the, the, the intuition that mattered Remember when we were looking at um, link, when, when we were looking at, you know, reconstructing these things from either SVD or from eigenvectors, a small number of, um, what you call it, of eigenvectors had the property of, of piercing together most of the structure of the image or the matrix. And if you take the most important of these eigenvectors, in reconstructing what the similarity is, okay? The, 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 the stuff that is gonna get dropped or left for the less important vectors is gonna be the kind of random noise or arbitrary little connections here. And since that's what's gonna kind of go away, what gets left should ideally be pretty robust. So the number of eigenvectors is the number of clusters. The number of eigenvectors is the number of feature dimensions you want to do your k-means clustering on, but it is not necessarily the number of clusters. Suppose we had only used two eigenvectors. Let's think about it. Let's say that we had only used two eigenvectors. Let's say we didn't use the third one. And we now want to cluster the points using k means where this is the x value and this is the y value. What do we think this would look like? To my world, all of these points would probably, um, they're both there, high in one and low in the other. So all of these guys would probably get clustered. These examples over here are points that were low in, in the first x dimension and high in the first dimension. These points would be misclassified if I only use two eigenvectors. Does everybody kind of see that? If I now did k-means on this, I suspect I would be able to reconstruct, if you told me did k-means with three clusters, it would generally, even if I only use two vectors, it would generally be enough to identify this cluster as being different than the points here, which were both uh, high and high, from these things, which were kind of medium and low. So the number of vectors is kind of just a number of features that we wish to use in our clustering. The more features, the more it captures the original data. The less features, the more noise and stuff it's actually dropping. Okay. 
the engineering choice is how many vectors do we want to use? And then when we're making k-means, how many clusters do we use? The number of vectors we use should probably be decided by our point set and by the size of the eigenvalues, okay? Or just said, you know, okay, I'll use three or four or five dimensions. Then the number of clusters, you have to just choose the way we choose cl number of cl clusters in k-means, try different values of k, and then judge how good the clustering is. This is a great clustering over here because the error, okay, if we measure the error, if these were the centroids, the average error, the, the average difference between a point and its center is quite small and we're only using three clusters, okay? So I claim that the decision of how many eigenvectors you use versus the number of clusters, you can decouple those. Any questions? Uh, another question for special clustering. Does it have to take a graph as an input or can it just take a set of points as an input? Well, spectral clustering was assuming if we were gonna be doing this uh, eigen, you know, this, this partitioning based on eigenvalues, okay? eigenvectors, we needed to have a separate, we needed to have a symmetric matrix and we needed to have a square matrix, okay? So, so long as you had a square matrix, okay, that was symmetric, you could do, use the eigenvector, you know, you, you, you could use the eigenvector decomposition, okay? And take the most important ones and use those as features. The analogous thing that you could do for arbitrary features is of course, take your, your feature matrix and do something like SVD to reduce the number of dimensions. And you could be able to, um, what you call it? Uh, you know, what you call it? Based on that, you would throw away noise from your data set, okay? And redundancies and things like that in a similar notion that the eigenvector decomposition does. The difference is that there is some theoretical properties about uh, the eigenvector decomposition on Laplacians and how that relates to conductance that gives us sort of theoretical properties why this will produce guaranteed high conductance clusters. But in general, I think that uh, uh, again, if you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you have a smaller number of robust dimensions, it's easier for the k-means to separate them into meaningful clusters. Okay, and that's the basic idea of uh, spectral clustering. Any questions? If not, I will see you on Tuesday, and I promise you, I will have your uh, progress reports graded till by then. Okay, thanks a lot. And I'll see you then.